Okay, everybody, we're ready to start with the panel discussion. Good afternoon. My name is Aaron Shalom. I'm going to be the moderator for the following discussion. We have three very special people here today from all around the Jewish community. Shalom Bezin, Sharon Fondel, and Lori Logal. They're here to share their personal journeys in the search for Kabbalah, where they've been, where they are now, where they hope to be in the future. Originally, we were going to have one more uh, panelist, but Ashlansky, unfortunately, he was called away and he can't be here with us today. The way the panel is going to work is there are going to be three rounds of questions. I'm going to ask the same question to each of the panelists in turn. I'll have a few minutes to respond and give the give, give, say on the matter. We'll go on to the next one, the next one, and then we'll go into round two and then round three. At the end, we're going to open up the discussion to the audience and take questions and comments from there. Okay? Yeah, One question. Yes. Share with me the connection to the The connection between what? This is you're telling me people have discussed where they are and what they are. Yes. But this is a session that's devoted to the field. That's correct. So what's the connection? The connection in the kavano when when they're when when they're davening um, in shul on their own and how they progress in that topic. As the rabbi said earlier. Okay, so I'm just going to move that line here. So, question one is, in your personal journey towards greater kavana in prayer, how did you start? Where are you now? And what has worked and not worked for you? important to say that I am probably the youngest person here, so I don't know anything. I don't claim to know anything. Uh, I just want to express that I'm one of the younger people here. Um, one of the, there's another young, youngest person here, but together we're the youngest people here. But, and um, so therefore I'm not claiming to know anything more than any of you. I, I don't know anything. I, I'm limited to knowledge from a human being. And, um, I'm only 24. But, starting from that point, which is the reality that I don't know, we all know a little bit of something. Um, and so in my own personal experience, everyone has their own personal experience, that we can speak from. I think that I started from a place of tefillah by rote, you know, just saying tefillah as part of the things we're supposed to do as human beings, particularly given as Jews. And, um, as I did it more, I realized that there's this cognitive dissonance between uh, praying and um, and not feeling anything afterwards. Because I think the essence of prayer is to actually start to feel, it's to open up one's heart. And the Sivu Shalom, uh, he was a, one of the Islam or Rebbeim, he speaks about how tefillah is really the opening of one's heart and developing one's heart because we know that the Talmudim of Rabbi Akiva during this time, we just passed the, 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 the change over, but they were so focused on developing the intellect that actually they, mis, they misappropriated energies that they were given only to the mind and not enough to their heart. And so much so that once we passed 32 days, which is Gematria Leif, 32 days of, of the Omer, once you pass 32 days, the heart of the Omer, then we don't have to mourn anymore. Because the whole idea is building late to 49 days of the Omer, is developing our heart. So my personal experience was really trying to figure out what is tefillah all about? Why don't I feel the ah to feel ah to feel ah? Is why don't I feel the ah? I don't feel the godliness in anything I'm doing. I feel kind of by and it's to no one's fault other than to my own. Because, you know, in Ena Nili Nili, if I'm not for myself, then who is for me? So, my own personal journey, I think it started from a place of doing but not feeling. And it's, I'm trying to enter this place of feeling. Um, Rav Cook says in Ola Sariya that the, the effect of tefillah, the effect of tefillah is the affect of, of your soul, of feeling your soul. So I think the most important thing that I've gained on my own personal journey 
is that speaking to God is the sweetest thing that a soul can possibly do in this world. As Rick Cook himself says, the soul is always praying. And unless you realize that the soul is always trying to be dubbing, is trying to clean, trying to connect to Kuchericha, to the mass of the world, so then your words of prayer aren't really as valuable. They're not really affecting as much as they can. So I bless us all. And I think the first level of, of getting into prayer is really tasting the sweetness of prayer. Chirvasa Lokim Nito, as it says, telling them, connecting to God, that is the only good thing in this world. Yeah. The question that, that Aram posed is actually four questions. Um, where did you start? Where are you now? What has worked and what hasn't worked? So it's interesting that, that Shlomo said, Davening by road. I have this clear, crystal clear memory of being in 10th grade in the Davening room at my high school, based out of Baltimore, the old campus, 1970. And I remember looking at the page, and it was the page of Baruch Sha'amar. And the next thing I knew, I was hearing the Chazani say Yishtabach. And I was still staring at Baruch Shamar. And what was worse than that was I didn't really care. It was like, OK, so no big deal. Rini asked about how, how we inspire, those of us in Chinuch, how we inspire. Little kids, because of their tmimut, get it. Those of us who are more mature, because we've processed it, get it. It's that in-between time when the kids are figuring out where they are. They're already jaded. They don't have you know, the prefrontal cortex to process everything. They don't know. They don't want to know. And that, to, to us in Chinuch, is the biggest, biggest challenge. Because I think you need some, some maturity and understanding to really rate Related to Fila. So what did I do? What do I teach my students? I talk to them about my friend God. And my friend God is the first one I want to speak to in the morning and the last one I want to speak to every night. And sure as the day is long, the first one I speak to in the morning, is my friend God. And the last one I speak to at night, Hamapil Shma is my friend God. And I always talk to them about my friend God, because ultimately, what we're all seeking, as the Rav said before, is a relationship with a Kodesh Baruch You can't say you have a relationship with someone if you don't talk to them, if you don't communicate with them, if you have nothing to do with them. So if we are going to develop a relationship with a Kodesh Baruch by definition, we're going to be talking all the time to our friend God. Um, some of you have heard me say this, that uh, Rav Soloveitchik, in his book, Lonely Man of Faith, talks about existential loneliness, how there are points in everybody's life where they believe that there is not a soul in the world who can possibly understand what they're going through. And everybody, this happens to everybody universally. And Rav Soloveitchik says that's one of the reasons, that's one of the points of our relationship with God, because God will understand. God is the solution to existential loneliness. If something happens to me, I say, Kaddish Baruch let me share this with you, and he will understand. That's part of the relationship. But by definition, that relationship is a dialogue. And yes, I said a dialogue, not a monologue. Kaddish Baruch doesn't talk in words, but Kaddish Baruch talks loud and clear for anybody who is open to listen to what he's saying to us as we done him. The other thing that happens is it puts each of us in perspective every single day, at the beginning of the day, beginning of the beginning of the day, within the scope of the universe. Although, Bishvili Nivra Ha'olam, I'm not the epicenter of the universe. Nobody here is the epicenter of the universe. And when we say, Baruch Sha'amar Bahaya Ha'olam, blessed be the one who just uttered and the world came into being, that reminds me of my infinite worth and my infinite negligibility at the same time. And it allows me to go forth with the Anivas to treat the children of Hashem, if you will, the way they need to be treated. But all of that starts with reminding 
uh, ourselves of it through tefillah. <coughs> that's the starting, that's how I got to, to where I am now. What works? Particularly for me. One of the things, and I know there are a number of people in this room who can relate to this, uh, the children of survivors have a sort of different view on the world. And one of the things that happened to me early on was that I memorized the old tefillah because I was afraid that, like my parents, there would be no sitter accessible. And I had to know what to do. So I memorized the old tefillah. And I got with my eyes closed because it shuts out everybody. It shuts out everything except me and him. And it works for me. It doesn't distract me. There were no visual distractions. And there were no um, auditory distractions. There have been times when people say, oh my goodness, did you hear that sitter fall in shul? No, I didn't. Because it's me and it's him. And when you close your eyes, all you see is infinity. The ain't self, if you will. Um, the other thing is, a long time ago, I heard a shear from the Rav. It wasn't a halacha shear, it was a philosophy shear. Um, Rav Soloveitchik. Rav Soloveitchik much preferred philosophy to halacha. But what he said was, the amida is the amida. And just because you're up to Chazarab Hashat doesn't mean it's not the amida. You stay standing. So you had your tefillah lachash, but even if the shaliach tzibur is still doing Chazarab Hashat, you are still standing in amida formation because it's your amida. And that made sense to me. And I do it. And it focuses the mind on listening to what, is the, what does it mean, shaliach tzibur? the messenger of the whole community who is representing all of us together um, sending those tefillot heavenward. And for me, it focuses me. And I send all of Amidah in Amidah formation, if you will, which is why those of you women who daven at 845 um, upstairs will see that I'm all the way in the corner. Because Chaz Shalom, I don't want somebody not to be able to get out because I'm still standing on me that. So I'm in the corner. Anybody can move anywhere they want. I won't bother them. That's what uh, Rav Goldberg was saying, right? It's not about me. It's about the whole, the whole seaboard. The last thing um, that works for me in particular is understanding what I'm saying and thinking about what I'm saying. What are the words? So I'll give you an example. Um, when we take the, the Torah out of the Aram, and we say, Baruch Shanatan Torah, Le'amo Yisrael Bikdu Shata. So in the olden days, when everybody repeated words, we used to sing, Baruch Shanatan Torah, Torah, Le'amo Yisrael Bikdu Shata. I know people are much more productive not to repeat any words these days. But to me, that Torah, Torah, was tremendously, and is still tremendously significant. I work in a community school, and I work with very serious Jews, many of whom don't believe the Torah Shabbatav is something Shematan Hashem, and most of whom don't believe that the Torah Shabbat is something Shematan Hashem. So for me, in my mind, to say Baruch Shematan Torah Torah Liamo Yisrael is me reaffirming inside myself. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave the Torah Shabbatav, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave the Torah Shabbatav, and that's what I'm thinking as we're taking that Sefer Torah out of the arm. I think about what I'm saying. And that's, that's what works for, for me. OK, we'll have this, the proverbial tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> and we can all safely go home now. <laughs> Uh, where I started from was um, I did not grow up religious at all. I learned all this stuff when I got married, which is, I think, like 39 years now. Uh, I learned it back in the beginning. And for me, it was very dry in the beginning. I didn't really know what I was reading. I had no idea of the translation. I still really don't. I need the translation. Uh, but uh, I think I just kind of decided on my own maybe about 10 years, 10, 12 years ago to really get more serious about my Yiddishkeit. 
and I got myself an interlinear, interlinear sitter so that I could look at the English. And so that's what I do. I look at the English while I'm reading Hebrew so that I know every word that I'm saying. And like Sharon, to me it is all about the relationship with Hashem. It's do you really believe Hashem is standing before you? Because if you have that imagery in your head and you really and truly feel it inside, there's really, there's no way you can't have Kavana while you're talking. I mean, that doesn't mean that you're not going to have things entering into your head that you don't want to think about during the Dabi, but I use those to my advantage. And what I do is, if something comes into my head that doesn't have to do with the Dabi or doesn't have to do with Hashem, I immediately focus back in on the page with intense concentration. And what that does is actually, it has actually increased my Kavana because it not only is that line that I'm reading with, with extra Kavana, but it continues with the rest of what I'm what I'm davening, and I'm able to kind of maintain that until the next time it happens. But I've, got, I've gotten pretty good at it, and it has really, really helped me. Um, another thing that I do, this is just little tips that I do personally, is I picture the words on a page as if with a laser beam, because a laser, the light does not diffuse. It's just a straight light that goes right to the direct place you're aiming it. And if you're looking at the words that way, where you're seeing them as just, like I say, just nothing outside of those words, that helps me tremendously. Another imagery that I use is there used to be, I think it was on the tape, Today Show, one of these shows where you'd have the people that were you know, doing the, the show, and then you'd have people outside who were looking in the window and kind of you know, like waving or whatever. And I kind of sometimes I see myself as that person who is sitting there and, and concentrating on what I'm concentrating and all those thoughts and things that come to my head are like those people out there. I have no, they're not, they don't relate to me at all. Um, that's another thing I do. And um, I just wanted to also say about, I just want to make a comment about Rabbi Goldberger just because I thought of this and I wanted to mention it. When he was talking about about living in this world and how much are we living in this world, how much are we living outside of this world. What I try to do all day long, I, try, I talk to Hashem like you're saying all day, all day long, it's all about Hashem. And I try to do everything that I do, I try to say, it doesn't not, does not across the board, but I try to say, I'm doing this L'Shem Shemayim. And if you can say that about everything that you do, because almost everything we do is, if we're eating or if we're sleep, if we're going to sleep, L'Shem Shemayim, and that's, that's kind of a test for me. If I can say that about the thing I'm about to do, then I know what I'm going to be doing is something that is what Hashem wants me to do. So, that's all. Okay, round one. <laughs> all right. I just wanted to summarize a little bit of what we just went through. Um, there seems to be a few common elements, actually, between all three responses at this point. Everyone seems to be starting from common ground of indifference or, in certain cases, ignorance of the prayer or what it means, um, and that wasn't feeling so good. Uh, the next steps sounded like there was a certain personal, individual uh, awakening to study the prayer book itself, to study the Sibur, or to look into more um, of Imuna concepts, faith concepts, and get a clearer understanding of our relationship to Hashem. What I'm wondering is whether that individual work and those individual steps, what would happen if we kind of did that as a group? We were all awakening to these, to these, to these concerns and accepting a certain level of indifference or, or distance from the prayer. How would it feel to get together as a group and study the prayer book or study concepts in the movement and, and work together and combine our power? I think it would be pretty amazing. The next question. For round two, we start with Shlomo. Do you take different approaches towards communal versus personal prayer? Again, I, I don't know anything, but to start with something is that um, is that um, I think communal and personal prayer they're both they both have similar um, needs 
I, when we're personally praying, we're communing with prayer. So the first thing I said was that prayer is the sweetest thing. Now, in a certain way, you could think that's lofty, that's, that's not grounded, like, okay, so where do you go with that? We have to actually be practical in this world. So that's why, you know, it's the sweetest thing that actually nourishes us. You know, water is really, when you get to the taste of water, you know, having fluoride in your water, and you're having, like, real water, it's actually the sweetest thing. And not only that, but it's, it actually makes, makes your body run properly. So the same thing is true with tefillah. Tefillah, like water, comes from the highest places, and it goes down and nourishes the lowest places. So tefillah is similar to that. Um, and it's the most grounding thing, I think, for a Jewish soul, is prayer. And it's not like, it doesn't take us to this lofty state for the sake of loftiness. Um, there's an idea of going down to go up, but I also believe there's an idea of going up and then go down. That as, as Rabbi, Berger, Rabbi Goldberger was expressing, that um, we as Jews, we go up into prayer, and then we bring all that lofty understanding and the connection to Hashem back into the grounded situations that we stand in, at work, with our family, cleaning the dishes, all these practical things, and we actually elevate them back up to Hashem. So it's going up to go down, to actually bring the world back up altogether. So I think tefillah is the most grounding thing in the entire universe. It's not the most lofty thing. It's loftiness for the sake of actually embracing what you're going through. Um, it's to feel the ah again in what you're doing. And when Nachman says, I just want to read a line or two from the Kutumarnan, when Nachman says something profound, now, Ki um, Tfila, he says in Torah 7, in the seventh Torah, Ki Tfila l'mala mitava, prayer is above nature, right? The natural world is like, all right, there's no way I'm going to pass this Chumash test. The natural world is there's no way I am going to be able to get this work done for this, um, for this uh, presentation at my job as a lawyer and, uh, at the court case. Because the nature says this is what happens next. This leads to that and that leads to that. But the unique thing about tefillah is that it changes the natural world. It actually changes it. Because when you connect, it's, what tefillah is, is you're connecting to Hashem, who is in charge of the natural world. And you can change it at any time. Like a programmer can always change the program. And this is a miracle. And that's why we need to have faith. We need to have faith in Hashem that He can make miracles happen because He began this program, this computer program called Planet Earth with all of us. All of us. And therefore, he could renew something, he could change something. And it's in Hashem's hand to change anything as he so wishes. He understands the program. And so the last thing I want to say was, okay, so we're going up into tefillah and we're going down into the world. But let's say I am not mentally there. How do I get there? So, we know in Shema we say, We lose when we go too fast. The key is, it doesn't mean you have to dive in a, like, you know, one word a minute, but it means that, you, like Rabbi Goldberg was saying, you take five to ten seconds before you go into prayer, and you slow down. You put away the phone, put it on silent, and you get into the mode of tefillah. You have to press the button. The button is, is standing still for a second. It's slowing down. And Amir Shilach says, uh, Ishmael, sir, says, um, and Pasha Spahalosha, where it's talking about moving, moving in the camps, how they moved. So it says that the Jewish people, according to however long the, the clouds stopped, so they stopped. And, and, and however long they stopped was, was the ability with which they can go forward. So um, I don't know the Pasha with me, but the basic idea there, says Amishlach, is we see that however long you stop is however long you're able to travel further. So a lot of people think, no, I have things to do, I have to get to work, I have to do this. So when I'm praying, it's really wasting time because I'm not able to be productive, right? I'm losing productivity time. But Mamash, that's completely antithetical to, to how Ruchnis works. Ruchnis works is when you go slow and connect Hashem, automatically all your Ishtadlas is a thousand times stronger. Everything you do is a million times stronger because you just brought infinite energy. You brought godliness into the finite. Brought infinitude into the finitude. And so I bless us all that I think that's the next level. The next level of prayer is slowing down into the prayer, appreciating the value of prayer and how it actually grounds us in our life and it makes everything we do extremely more potent and poignant 
and, and all the work we do, it travels a thousand times further. Because when you slow down, when you take a rest, when you get eight, six, eight hours of sleep, so then you're able to go and travel for however many days, however many hours in your day. If you don't sleep, actually, and you try to just work your entire life and you never sleep, you'll get less done. So you need to sleep. And in a way, sleeping is the highest thing. By going down, you're really going up. And prayer is you're going down into the words, but you're actually elevating yourself into all of that. That what you're doing with more strength and more of yourself. Just have to say here that Shlomo is a joy to work with. Shlomo's the same age as one of my kids, and I know there is a good, solid future for B'nai Israel. So thank you. Um, this was an interesting question, question number two. Do you take different approaches towards communal versus uh, personal prayer? And it's assuming the premise is that they're mutually exclusive. And I think the two are inextricably connected. And the paradigm that I always use in my own mind is the Kedusha from the Amidah. So we're all familiar with the halachot surrounding Kedusha. You're not allowed to say Kedusha unless there's a minyan, which means unless it's tefillah b'tzibor, you can't even say the words. But as you're standing in the middle of that tzibor, it's usher to speak, it's usher to gesture, it's usher to look at anybody else, it's usher to move. We stand alone before God, but only in the presence of a tzibor. That's the paradigm of communal and personal prayer. They're mixed together. My tefillah balachash? Yeah, why is it balachash? Because the Kodesh Baruch is sitting on my shoulder. He hears what I'm saying, but it's not enough. I need the chazar tashats because now the Kodesh Baruch is sitting on all of our shoulders, on you know the, the big communal shoulder, if, if you will. Having said that, obviously, if you're not in the middle of a tzibor, then there's personal prayer. And that, to me, is something that, if you will, l'chachila, uh, not a bidiyevet. It's organic to everything that we are. And I'll tell you the following story is a paradigm. When I say we are, I mean we as Jews, we as human beings. About a week after 9-11, uh, I had to be in, in New York. And my friend and I went down to Ground Zero. And they still hadn't cordoned it off. You still really could go to Ground Zero. There were still ashes in the air. It was a devastating sight. So I did the only thing I could think of and what's my natural response. I always carry a safer diddle with me. It's in my purse. And I pulled that diddle. And the two of us started reciting Tehillim because there was mamish, no other response you could have. And we're saying Tehillim together out of this teeny tiny little safer Tehillim that I carry. And we look up, and there are about two dozen people surrounding us. And we start looking at them, and one of them goes, what are you doing? And I said, we're reciting Psalms. And they said, could you say them in English so we can be reciting them with you? And there were two dozen that turned into three dozen, turned into four dozen people who were listening to the recitation of Tehillim in English because nobody had anything that they could say. And why use our words when we have the words of the Baal Tehillim? I can't say it better than David HaMelech said it. It was the only response we could have. That's what I mean. Personal prayer is organic. It's where we turn when there's nothing else to do. When there's no other way we can help, whether it's an, a situation like 9-11 or Lo Aleinu, a personal illness, we can always help by turning to HaKadosh Baruch Hu organically as a natural, as a natural response. That's beautiful. <laughs> um, I, Sometimes I feel like I get a little more out of my dominating at home because I can take it a lot slower, and I really, really enjoy that. Uh, but when I go into shul, it is a, an extremely special thing for me. I actually have inside my glass case. I, I saw this, and, I, and I, I typed it up, and I put it in here. And I say this when I open my glass case, and that is, know where you are entering, what you will do there, 
who is in this house, whose house it is, and who empowered you to enter this house. And that just, to me, kind of really says it all. Um, and I don't like you, I don't, you know, there's no, no talking to me. It's, it's, you know, I ask myself, well, if, if Mashiach suddenly appeared, please, today, and he came into our shul, would there be anybody in the shul that would talk at any point? I don't think so. Hashem is in that shul, just as real as Mashiach. And I think when we're talking about our relationship and believing that he is really there with us, because if we do, I mean, that's, that's what affects me more than anything. And in shul especially, because, you know, this is God's house. Um, so, you know, at home it's a little bit different, and uh, I have my own, you know, things that help me there, because I'm not in God's house, but I'm not required to be in shul like a man, so... So I have that luxury, but um, but anyway, they're a little bit different, but both incredible, incredible experiences. Between the three of you, it sounded like there was a connection at the roots in all types of prayer: communal prayer, personal prayer. All prayer is is organic. Is this is this language that the, the whole world speaks? Eric Shira actually says that the entire world actually speaks. It's not just human beings. All of the animals, all the creations are, seem to be praying. Two of its seaboard seems to be, more than anything else, uh, a vehicle to amplify the prayer that we're already, they were already doing. When we have the holiness of, of the of the Beit HaMikdash, the Beit HaKneset, the Hashem, and surrounded by other souls who are doing this at the same time, it just takes what's already there and makes it into something even more amazing. And then the last, the third and last question is, where do you see yourself going in the future, in terms of Kabbalah, in terms of prayer? <coughs> That's the one I have any choice. Where do you see yourself going in the future? So, I think the goal would be is to um, align myself with Hashem or to consider things that Hashem considers things. If you are the root, and if you want to go to the future, you also have to go to the past. So, the first time we see the Shoresh of Tefillah, which is actually Palal, expressed in the Torah as by Yaakov. And he says, Liros panach alo falal, alo filalti. To see your face, he was talking about Yosef, I couldn't have considered. So if you look in the Torah Shlema there, it talks about, I once looked at it, it talks about how Tefillah, Palal, really means like four different things. I couldn't get it in my hands before I got here. But uh, if I did, we would read it together. But he says there that Palal means um, to consider. I didn't even consider seeing your face, Yosef. Like, it wasn't something that I, that I considered. I just kind of gave up on it. Um, also, we know by Noah, a separate, separate point, by Noah, in, um, it, it says in the Zohar that, uh, that Hashem, the Noah said to Hashem, Hashem, how come you let this happen? How come you let the world be destroyed? How come you let this marvel take care to occur? And Hashem says, an idiot. Noah, I gave you the koach of prayer and you didn't use it. So I think for the future, we have a lot of things coming our way. We have a lot of concerns and a lot of, a lot of things to consider, right? Allow me considerations. So I think that the future for all of us, and definitely for me, because I'm included in all of you, and, and we're included in each other, is really the um, is really praying for the things which are lacking in the world, right? You have a uh, of Tzadok Akonu Levlin writes in Kesatzad that um, that's the first thing I ever learned actually. And he says that the only way to pray and the only way to learn Torah is by acknowledging the fact that we're lacking in something. If I realize I have all knowledge, so then it's impossible for me to learn anything new because I'm already all known. If I think I have everything I need, so what is prayer? It's, I, there's nothing to go to Hashem for. So I think the union is, is, to, is to acknowledge the things that we lack, to acknowledge the things that are lacking in the world. If we're concerned about climate, or we're concerned about sustainability because we're, we're throwing out so many plastic plates and, and we're considered about the trash building up and that the, the, and, and the Venice is going to get you know, covered up. Well, I mean, whatever you want to think about. Or you're considered about your children and then growing up to be and like connected to our mitzvahs in a generation where there's a flood of technology and social media which actually distracts us from ourselves and getting to know ourselves and ultimately getting to know the right person for ourselves and we have the wrong visions of things. So then really to feel it is the tool for the future. 
it is like the only way to bring the ideal future out is to pray for it. And if we don't pray for it, we're being a little bit stupid. I think there is a fundamental beauty in the balance between keva and kavana. The idea that we still say the words that Rabbi Gamliel put together so many thousands of, okay, 2,000 years ago, not so many thousands, 2,000 years ago, that our great, great, etc. grandparents said, mamish the same words, there's a power in that. But the fact that even kavua in that keva, there's a place for me to add my own words, I'm building on their shoulders with my kavana. There's something interesting about kavana, that if we think we've achieved it, it's tautological, but by definition, we have it. Because as soon as you think you're there, that means you've lost your intention and your kavana. It's asymptotic, right? And asymptote, and forgive me, math people in the room, because math is not my strong suit, an asymptote is if you have a measure, and you cut it in half, and you cut it in half, and you cut it in half, you will never get to zero, right? If you take a step, and then take a, a half a step, and a half of that step, you will never reach the end of the line. That's what kavana is. It's asymptotic. I can approach kavana. I can approach HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the perfect way. I can get closer and closer with the realization that I, I will never be there because I'm a human being. And it is an absolutely divine enterprise. That doesn't mean we don't keep moving towards that end goal and getting closer and closer. With the understanding that there's always more work to do to, to achieve. Uh, for me, Getting my uh, kavana to be better and better is about learning. So I do a lot of a lot of tapes on uh, on uh, davening, on um, kavana, which I've listened to many times. I also read a lot on it. I just want to say two books, uh, Praying with Fire one and two are tremendous, and also a book called uh, Building a Sanctuary in the Heart of Love, Mishkan Evna in English. They came out in English uh, by Schwartz. Uh, are really two things that have helped me tremendously. So my hope is that I can just keep reading and keep studying and just keep, you know, getting going to things like this uh, to, like you say, to get as far as we can go because but we can't go to the limit. That's not, and that's the good thing because we always know there's further. It's never where okay, I'm satisfied where I am. It's always, you know, I want to build on what I have and, and get stronger and stronger and, and have it be more and more meaningful uh, for me. So that's that's what I, I hope to do is just to go higher. All the time. I heard that Kabbalah seems to be, or prayer seems to be movement as opposed to an attainment. It's supposed to be the end of the road. It's the, it's the journey more than anything else. And that part of the journey is considering where you are and maybe where you aren't, considering something that's beyond you. Uh, and, and that is the tool for the future, that's the tool for progress. And part of that considering is to study to study books, to study, to study the ideas of the Bekus and of Hashem and to get together with those concepts. At this time, we're going to open up for comments and questions. We're going to start over here. Yes? Do you ever get the sense in your davening, particularly on these communal things, um, like a sense of like, what's the use? You know, like kind of you see, um, I don't know, all the conflict in Israel, it doesn't seem like Mashiach uh, you know, really is coming. Um, and it's like, okay, look, I, you know, I have no problem praying for my own personal things, but um, like, what's really the use? Do you ever get the feeling in terms of um, you know, the larger things that we're always davening for? Yerushalayim, Yircha, that's some of it. And, and if you do, like, what advice would you give to, uh, to those of us that get that feeling? The more, uh, the more, the more you value the prayer, the more it can do. So, 
when when you value it, now it's so valuable. So then it does a lot. But if you actually envision, let's say like the the Baal Shem Tov or um, or Avram Avinu or whoever, when they envisioned like let's when they envisioned uh, someone who's really sick and they were praying for them, they actually valued the prayer so strong. So that's why immediately after they prayed, they were actually healed. Because the more the more you value what you're doing, the more it does. If you don't value the, um, if you don't value college, you won't finish college. You won't necessarily do it. You won't, it won't necessarily get you anywhere. If you don't value value the medicine that you're taking, that's something that's going to transform you. It's the placebo effect, right? The more you value it, the more it works. So all the more so, it's something spiritual. It's not the placebo effect. It's just the actual effect. Is that when you value what you're doing? When you value this prayer, so then it actually might be able to bring the, uh, the Mashiach, first of all. Like the the Lubavitcher Rebbe was famous for saying that if one of us people in this room or in the world actually prayed for the Mashiach with all of our heart, so you'd actually come. So things we don't value the prayers we pray for the Mashiach. And so I think what the real Indian is, is like these terrorist attacks, it, they're terrible and, and they're painful and they're they're trying to bring out of us that real bakasha. They're trying to bring out of us this real ratzon for peace in the world. We, I think we need to want peace more. I remember talking to my mom about her experiences in the Holocaust, and this was one of the things that came up. You know, where was HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Where were, everybody was stopping, and my mother looks at me and she goes, but the Holocaust ended, and it ended, before the Jewish people were destroyed. Why do you think the tefillah didn't work? How do we know the tefillah aren't working? Chas v'shalom. What could be the state of the world if we were davening for Yerushalayim and for Tzemach David? That's, that's the, the bitachon that Kadosh Baruch Hu is taking care of us, but we don't see the parallel universe of the lack of, of tefillah. Yeah, our, our worldview is not Hashem's worldview. You know, we're just looking at it in time and space. He's seeing, he's above everything, and he sees what's, gonna, what's going to happen, what did happen. It's like an analogy if you have a, a 500 page book and you open up to the middle and somebody slips on a banana peel and you say, well, why would they do that? You gotta read the book, you gotta read the beginning, you gotta read the end of the book. Uh, to know what's going on. And also, another really beautiful analogy I heard is that is that this world is like a tapestry. If you turn the tapestry over, it's strings and it looks all confused. You turn it back over again, and you see this beautiful, beautiful tapestry. And I believe that Hashem knows what he's doing. You know, it looks very bad for us right now. Things look bad. It's like, what, what, like you say, what, are, what are, is our tefillah accomplishing? Sometimes it doesn't accomplish the thing that you're davening for. Just like some, you daven for a person, and sometimes that person doesn't get better, but your tefill is not wasted. It will be used at another point down the road somewhere for some other person who needs it. So I believe that every every tefillah that we daven is is always worth something, and it's always heard by Hashem. Every sincere tefillah. Um, sometimes, yeah. Could you um, speak about? Um what you think of meditation and what role meditation, if any, has in your experience? They say that the Shimon is the deepest meditation. I don't think you need to go on a mountain to connect to God to meditate. I believe that meditation is is something that uh, is really best used in, in the things you're already doing. Like, have you ever meditated while you eat your food? It's the deepest experience. I do it all the time. And you actually it's such a deeper experience. Have you ever meditated while doing dishes? I do it all the time. Yeah, I meditate, and all the more so, have you ever meditated in your Shemona essay? And you know, meditating is like, just, it's just like really dvekas. It's just connecting to Hashem and what you're doing. Like, someone who doesn't have God, so meditation might be just like kind of feeling, ah, it's great, it's good, it's just a nice feeling. I don't think of stresses. But real meditation is dealing with all those stresses with God and bring you into all of it. So uh, that's that's the way I use meditation for it. In my Shemona Esa recently, I've been meditating on the fact that, I'm, that by saying these words, I'm channeling Hashem, and I get to be a uh, Merkava for Hashem. So that's what I've been meditating on, based on the teachings of Rav Dober, and he writes a lot about that. Actually.
Um, a number of years ago, I was trained in meditation for reasons that are a long story. Um, but the point of meditation is to affect transcendence. It's really what we're trying to ha happen to us in Sfila. After I was trained in meditation, I became firmly convinced that the Arba Sha'alul Lupardes were meditating, had somehow transcended their physical being so that their Hashama was standing before Kisei Akavon, but it was a transcendent experience emanating from meditation. It's an ephemeral experience. It's interesting, because if you read Shai Hak Noam, there's this underlying theme so often running through his works that he achieved something, and it went away, and he wants to make it come back, and he can't force it to come back. That's transcendence. I suspect it doesn't ever happen to anybody all the time while they die, and I also suspect that it happens to everyone on occasion when they die. And it depends on the individual. For some people, it may be that they're out in nature. For some people, you know, for me, the most transcendent place, believe it or not, is not the Kotel, is the southern excavations. Nobody's there to bother me. There's no fights over the southern excavations. And it was the entrance to Har Habayit. You can stand and look at the entrances to Har Habayit on the southern excavation. And we can each have those transcendental moments that come through the meditating on tefillah. I know that sounds convoluted. That makes sense to me. <laughs> um, I don't. I don't do. That. I guess I don't really do any. I guess the real meditation, what you, you know, how you describe it. But um, I, I do talk to Hashem for 35 minutes a day, personal prayer. And I guess during that time, I, I probably do some meditation. And my, my thing is Eno Milvado, which really means so much to me because it's that there is no other force in the universe except Hashem. And that nobody can touch anything of mine and that nobody can harm a hair of my head unless Hashem said, this is what's going to happen to you. So that, that Eno Milvado, Eno Milvado really helps me in, in, in any situation, sort of just meditate on that, but that he's the only thing, he's the only guy there is, and, and that's, you got it. That's, that's why you gotta be talking to him and, and asking him for things and not worrying about, about everyone else, just, you know, well, I mean, I mean, totally ignoring everybody else, but I'm saying as far as who you wanna ask for what you, what you desire in this world. Any more questions? Anybody have their own personal experience or ideas they want to share with the group? This would be a good time to do that. Yes.
mean, I, I, this is a little bit premature, sorry. But I, I want to thank Stuart and his lovely family um, for affording us this opportunity. Um, Rabbi Goldberger was great, and you guys are great. And just to think, I, I know you in other capacities, so what a wonderful thrill to see this other aspect of you. Thank you so much for being part of my community. Not about me, about my son. He was in Israel, he came from Israel, and he came to learn and he loved the yeshiva. And he was a very, very emotional, very serious little kid. So one Shabbos, he did not come much home, but one Shabbos he came home. And he used to jump for Milcha, jump like, you know, like in Pirkei Avot, as he said, Ratz Katsubi, jump into David. One Shabbos he came home and he fell asleep and I said he probably sick. I did not wake him up for Mincha. I said, how can I wake him? He always jumps and he, I never ever had to tell him to go to shul. He was a very serious child since he was born. Anyhow, I did not wake him up and after about 15 minutes, he jumps from bed and he was screaming it to me and crying. I was in a shock. I, I could not get over it. Ima, why did you do it to me? If you would know that I have to see Clinton in the 10 next minutes, you would let me sleep? You would wake me up and this is Melech Malchim Malchim. How did you do it? And this story I tell all the time in school to my students. And each time this is a way to shake them up all over the school, the boys' school, the girls' school. And it still runs after me. Whenever I see him jumping from bed and crying with tears, and I'll tell you, this is a real W. Oh, my God. <laughs> How old was he? At well, the he time? Was, uh, this time, 15. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, <coughs> whenever, whenever he used to come here and go to the yeshiva, to Daven, some of the rabbi came to me and said, <laughs> I never did anything, believe me. It's, I call it Shuta Bot, but it's not the same. Yeah, no, it's married. It's been done. A personal experience. The question is always the efficacy of prayer. Does it work? As a chaplain at uh, in Bethesda at the National Naval Medical Center um, at that time, uh, the Catholic priest on staff, Father McNew, he asked me, would you come and visit mom? She's in the hospital. So I come to visit his mother and I asked, uh, and he asked me, he said, Rabbi, you're a holy man, would you please pray for my mom? So I knew her first name, Catherine, whatever. And I said, how would you like me to pray? Do you want me to pray as I always pray in Hebrew? So he said, please pray as you always pray. So I got <coughs> the name, but, you know, whatever it was, and I prayed. And then I repeated it in English, and um, then I left. A few days later, the uh, priest comes up to me and he said, he said, Rabbi, God heard your prayers. Mama's out of the hospital. So I said, well, why was she in the hospital? And the answer that he gave me is because they came to give her tests for cancer, and they were very, very sure that she had the symptoms of having a cancer, and they did not believe that she would ever leave the hospital. And yet, after you <coughs> prayed, your prayer, the prayers were answered, and mom had no signs of the cancer and is out and I thank you. Well, not long after that, Father McNew, Jim McNew, he was um, promoted to commander and was going to receive his stripes. And it was 
in the admiral's quarters, right, right on the same floor with you, Luke. So I come in, and um, you know they're doing the whole ceremony and all. And he says, "And you'll eat with us." So I said, "You know." And he says, "Yeah, we have pizzas." <laughs> so I said, "Well, I, I can't eat that." You know. He says, "No, no, they're all kosher." So I said, what are you talking about? So I said, yeah, I've got the kosher pizza for everybody. <laughs> so I said, where did you get them? So he said, I went to the nut house. <laughs> and he said, and I went to the owner, and you know what he said? He said, he saw on, that I was wearing a cross, and he wanted to know why I'm wearing all of these kosher pizzas. <laughs> So he said, well, you know, there's a rabbi in the Navy at the hospital, and he doesn't eat any of these things, you know? So I wanted kosher so everybody can eat, and he can eat with. So Father said to me, he says, you know, do you know what the reaction was of the, at the pizza shop? So I said, no. He says, he cried. <laughs> Else? No, the, uh, there was a, a, an expression, I think, of a, of a kind of fatalistic attitude. And that is to say that everything that happens, it's because God wants it to happen. Um, God wills it to happen. And without getting into complicated questions of free will and God's omniscience, I think it's, it's better to say, not that God wanted it to happen, but that God let it happen. And that we have the ability sometimes to alter things. And God will let that happen. On Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, after we're in Tanatoka, we say, Uchvad Filat Stakam Abir Neturah Gezerah. It doesn't matter what translation you read, it says, um, Repentance, prayer, and charity will avert the evil decree. That's not a correct translation. Roa Hagazera is not the evil decree. Hagazera Haraa is the evil decree. Roa Hagazera is the evilness of the decree. Hakadosh Baruch Hu runs the world, but He allows us that window of tshuva, tefila, and tzedakah because Hakadosh Baruch Hu will choose to attenuate the evilness of any decree based on our relationship with Him through tshuva, tefila, and tzedakah. All right, uh, we'll take a, a 